super informative. Thanks, everyone. And now we're moving on from the venture world to the laboratory. Coming up now, we've got a dream panel with the heads of two of the world's leading research institutes. I will be speaking with MIT CCL head Daniela Roos and CMU head of robotics, Matthew Johnson Roberson. We'll discuss the latest robotics breakthroughs and the role universities can play in incubating early stage startups. But first, Let's start with this clip of the mini cheetah robot in action from researchers at MIT CSAIL. The team over at MIT has done some really amazing work with their little robot cheetah. My name is Brian Heater. I'm the hardware editor at TechCrunch. Thank you so much for joining us. It is absolutely my pleasure to be speaking with professors Daniela Roos and Matthew Johnson Roberson today. Uh, when we began the process of programming the show, bringing the two of them together was on my a short list of dream panels. Uh, the research side of the conversation is something that I think we tend to neglect far too often on our end. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, I spoke to Daniela on stage at our first robotics event in Boston way back in 2017. Uh, Matthew, meanwhile, is somebody who we've had on stage previously, but it was actually in a startup capacity the last few times. So let's start there. Uh, Matthew, the last time you and I spoke uh, earlier this year, you had just accepted the position as the director of CMU's Robotics Institute. What, uh, what has most surprised you about your first six months in the job? Uh, well, almost everything. It's been it's been a real whirlwind. Um, but I would say more than anything, it's been Pittsburgh. Um, so I was at Carnegie Mellon as an undergrad in the early 2000s. And the city is just so vibrant and energetic and has so much going on that I think maybe I missed out when I was here last, or maybe it's a lot of it's new, but uh, it's been it's been a real uh, pleasure to, to be back in Pittsburgh. And that's probably been the biggest thing that um, has surprised me and, and the companies and the amount of robots I see on a daily basis is pretty high, which um, uh, gets me excited. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, I've, I've been there a few times over the years, and I, I think the city itself is pretty radically transformed and CMU and specifically a lot of the uh, autonomous vehicle work that's being done there is a, is a big part of that, that evolution. Um, Daniela, you actually, I think, celebrated a decade in the uh, director of MIT CSAIL job earlier this year. I I'm really curious how your own job has changed over that time. Well, Brian, it's been such an exciting whirlwind. Honestly, it does not feel like 10 years at all. And uh, the opportunities that we have now to build programs, to, uh, to create opportunities, to, to bring uh, robots and AI and machine learning uh, to the world, to push the boundaries of knowledge uh, are just extraordinary. And so um, every day that goes by is a day full of excitement. And, um, and so uh, how has it changed? Well, it's been a, a whirlwind. Um, it's been a, a, um, a steep learning curve in the beginning, uh, but it's also been a huge amount of, time, uh, of, of fun. And I, for one, am so happy and, and uh, excited and honored to be doing this job. Yeah. I when I was going around traveling to a lot of these research institutes, you know, a decade plus ago, it, it, it still felt like a, a bit of a fringe category, you know, something that was like over the horizon that these things were going to be a part of our life in the, in the future. But um, a lot of that has definitely changed, especially over the past couple of years. The, so I'm I'm curious, you know, we were, we were talking about the COVID thing before. I think all of us have, or most of us have gotten it. Uh, Matthew, you're dealing with it right now. I was dealing with it last week. Um, I, I'm really curious how your respective departments have adapted to the challenges of, of learning and collaborating remotely during the pandemic. Um, Matthew, you want, you want to start with that? I know, I know you took the job kind of mid-pandemic. Yeah, look, and, and full credit to everybody that kind of um, did all the hard work um, during the sort of uh, worst and darkest parts of the pandemic. But, you know, 
uh, really at every higher ed institution, you've seen this um, incredible resiliency, but also really, really significant challenges. I think the two things that I've noticed the most is that um, there was a real um, uh, loss of, of the experience of being together as a group, uh, whether that be in the classroom, whether it be in the research group in the lab. And I think that was tough. And I don't think, you know, um, we've coped really well without that, but um, you can certainly see the cost of not being able to, to come together. And I think one of the um, kind of brightest spots of the last year has been um, through, you know, ups and downs, our ability to be together more certainly than before, right? And that's obviously with um, obviously the advances in vaccines and, and kind of a lot of public health measures um, helping to control the pandemic. But but most importantly, just students and young people and, and those who are kind of trying to learn um, have just showed just an incredible tenacity to stick with it. We graduated um, uh, three years worth of students at our most recent graduation, and it was just incredible to see them and their families come back and to realize they went through a lot. And uh, it was pretty cathartic to see them celebrating that achievement. And so, you know, my hope for the future is just that we continue to manage this thing. And more importantly, that, you know, we keep um, getting these high points of people really uh, being able to celebrate um, the hard work they're putting in because that didn't stop. Uh, online, it, it kept going and only got harder in some cases. So, that. the the last time I was in Boston, Daniel, I um, I visited CCL and I, I sat in on on one of your your morning meetings. And I one of the things I really appreciate what you're doing over there is a lot of the collaboration that's that's going on. A lot of these discussions. How difficult of a transition was it for your team to move fully remote for a couple of years? Well, Brian, we share a lot of what um, what Matthew um, described uh, in the CMU experience, um, but we also had our eyes set on continuing the work. So um, within MIT, shortly after the pandemic um, started, we um, we established a research ramp up working group and we developed uh, policies and procedures that ensure that the research enterprise uh, could go on and that ensured safe um, uh, safe conditions for people to actually come in and uh, and work together. So it was definitely not a, um, as as free as as before the pandemic, uh, but uh, but especially in in robotics and in areas that require specialized equipment, uh, we made a big effort to make sure that um, that people could come in and and uh, make progress towards their degrees and towards advancing knowledge. Now, um, I should say that um, as we learned about the virus and as we learned about um, transmission and what is safe and what is not safe, we also began to open up for, uh, for events and, um, and we had um, uh, safety protocols that, uh, that allowed people to come together and, uh, and discuss wearing a mask, so a little bit different than before, uh, but still, um, even sitting around the table wearing masks uh, is so much more productive and effective uh, than, uh, than being apart. Um, so um, we've had big events. I hosted TEDxMIT with 300 people um, last fall and nobody got COVID. Um, and it was very exciting uh, to be able to see um, so much energy, so much vibrancy, so much desire for people to be together as part of a community and exchange ideas. Is there a sense for either one of you in which um, the past two years will have kind of radically changed the way you're you're going to do things, or are things just now that the world is relatively returning back to normal? Are things returning back to normal in your labs? Well, in my research lab, um, things are back to normal. Everyone comes in uh, regularly on a on a daily basis. And, uh, and that is really exciting. But I think we have also learned some very valuable lessons from the pandemic. So the fact that we can actually have this conversation uh, today, despite everything, uh, is, is really extraordinary. There are events that reach uh, many more people because those events uh, can, be, can be done online. Um, last year, I hosted a 
a, a, a transatlantic event um, with um, uh, U.S. people and uh, Europe uh, Europeans um, about uh, the use of uh, robots and AI in medicine. We had over a thousand people participate. Uh, I don't think that uh, we uh, we will see uh, the same level of participation and engagement uh, for in-person events. And so I think it's important to uh, to kind of figure out what is what is important to do in person and how can we take most advantage of the new tools that allow us to so seamlessly collaborate and exchange with people, no matter where they are located. I would totally agree. And, and the one thing that I think I would add is just that, you know, one of the realizations that I think has been really important in higher ed has been that these are workplaces. And so I think, you know, beyond what we used to think about with students and sort of the sort of research apparatus, um, there's been a lot of changes that have happened in sort of uh, in, in industry around remote work and other things. And I think we're trying to port that um, uh, some of those um, things to, to the higher ed context, right? And so thinking about staff at the university and others who, who crave more flexibility. And so we've been really trying to make um, higher ed a, a workplace that's much um, more in line, I guess, with where the state of the art is in, in tech companies um, at CMU than it was before. And I think that was a push that wouldn't have happened without the pandemic. So um, hopefully that's a good thing. And hopefully people like um, where it's headed. In conversations I've had with both of you, you've, you've expressed this, um, this desire to have robotics and automation play, I guess, sort of a more ubiquitous role in our day-to-day our -day lives. And I'm curious why that's been such a motivator throughout your respective careers. And Daniela, why, why is that something that you've really uh, strove to achieve? Well, Brian, I, uh, I, I guess this dream of uh, having robots and machines help us with physical work um, goes back to my childhood for me. And uh, I, uh, I, I grew up uh, reading science fiction. I grew up fantasizing about, about a better world with machines. In fact, do, do you remember when Mickey summons the broomstick in The Sorcerer's Apprentice? Well, I absolutely love this piece. I loved it ever since I can remember. Uh, it's a piece that shows you can bring to life, you can animate everyday objects by magic. But today you don't need magic to make that happen. You need robots and AI. And so I think uh, we have an extraordinary opportunity uh, to, to think about intelligent tools, but at the same time to advance the science of intelligence, uh, to advance the science of autonomy, to really understand uh, nature, to understand the brain, and then take some of, um, some of the learnings and applying them to developing uh, better machines. And so in my lab, we are developing computational approaches for designing all types of robots, including soft robots, uh, out of a wide range of materials, everything that's available to us, silicon, paper, even food. Um, and then we have, um, we have some new work to advance the brains of these machines to enable uh, new applications. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's so exciting um, to me to think about where we are in robotics uh, at this point in time. If you think about it, the first industrial robot came in 1961, it was the Unimate. It was introduced to uh, automate pick and place operations. And since then, uh, the um, industrial automation community has built tremendous uh, robots uh, that have become masterpieces of engineering that can do so much more uh, than, than people do. So we have already achieved a lot with industrial robots, but industrial robots remain isolated from people on the factory floor because they're big and heavy and dangerous to be around. And so a question that I have been asking myself for the past decade is how can we enable robots to be partners for people, how can we enable robots to be uh, to be working safely side by side with people to become, um, in some sense, uh, seamless uh, teammates uh, to adapt to what people need rather than the other way around, which is what we have today. And so um, these these kinds of questions, I can trace them all the way back uh, to to my childhood uh, when I was reading about uh, extraordinary machines and I was fantasizing about various futures um, uh, with support and help from machines. And it's such a privilege 
to be able to to work on those problems and in fact to kind of you know work on my childhood dreams uh, if you if you will yeah, Matt, the first time we spoke, you, you expressed a, a similar sentiment and, and it stuck with me. I think it was something along the lines of, you know, I, I want to be able to look outside and see a robot in action. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, that's sort of one of the things that I, I think about a lot. I look out my window and I never see any robots and that makes me sad. Um, but I think it's it's very similar to, to uh, a lot of those same ideas. The, the concept for me about why we want to see these things deployed and, and out there in the real world helping people. It's really about connecting to other human beings. You know, if you think about um, what we do in robotics and, and AI, we, you know, we build systems and we spend, you know, hours and hours and hours in the lab working on them, perfecting them. And I think one of the kind of key human drivers of this whole um, enterprise is that, you know, I think many people deeply want to connect with other humans. They want to make things that impact other people's lives positively and uh robots is in fact incredibly collaborative and, and team driven um field but more importantly you know oftentimes i think the reason why it's so important to kind of have things that translate or connect with others is that sort of larger connection to society to the world i think is an incredibly grounding thing that is motivating, right? It, it is the reason why people want to get up in the morning and come to work. Um, building systems themselves is a really cool and lucky thing, um, but it's transcendent, I think, if you can do it in a way that that other people can connect with, understand, and benefit from. And so that's um, uh, really why I want to look out my window and see robots, and hopefully other people will look out and see them as well and be excited. So, um, yeah. A, a few years ago, anytime I would have a conversation around um, uh, research and, and the startup world, uh, the vast majority of people would tell me that at the time universities weren't really doing enough to kind of to, to accelerate, to incubate, to foster students' uh, startup ambitions. I, I would say that from my perspective, that seems to be changing, but um, let, let, Matt, Matt, let's start with you because obviously, you know, you've worn both of these hats as, you know, both a, a researcher and, and, um, and a CTO of a startup. Uh, are are universities doing enough to, to to foster startups among students? Look, I think it's a it's an ongoing challenge, um, but but fundamentally, I think what we want to do, and I think this is really where universities are getting better, is that universities want to facilitate students pursuing whatever their dreams may be, right? And I think I think one of the things that is is just happening more is that students are more aware of the startup ecosystem. They're more aware that that's a possible path for them, and and I actually say practically. Um, we're catching up at the same time that the rest of the community is catching up as well. I don't think venture was there. I don't think uh, lots of the sort of supporting infrastructure that you would need was there. And so in some ways, uh, I think we're hopefully all going to get there at the same time, which is that particularly for hardware based startups and, and things that are going to be deployed out there in the world. Um, there's just a lot of things that need to come together um, to really make that feasible. And if you think about that same arc, for SaaS based businesses and think about cloud infrastructure and where that was in the early 2000s and where it is now. And, and the barriers to entry for starting a, a SaaS business that is gonna use cloud infrastructure to scale, right? We still have a long way to go in robotics. And so I don't wanna say we're there, but I think that now um, there's just a lot more awareness. Uh, and then really fundamentally, yeah, I think we can be doing more universities and, and we're pushing to do that. But I think that at the end of the day, um, really we're, we're educational institutions need to be as they need to be equipping students with the tools and the um, confidence and the opportunities to go pursue what they want to do and and set them up and so that's where i'm hoping that we'll be soundly and then some students are going to go to startups some are going to go uh, do other things but at the end of the day uh, if they're getting to pursue their dreams i think we've we've done our job correctly yeah, Danielle. Again, you know, in, in the in the ten years that you've been in this position, I assume that you have seen that evolve quite a bit. Do, do you feel like the the relationship between universities and really, I guess, kind of commercializing some of the the work that you're be, doing is where it should be? Um, well, let me say that I agree with um, with how Matthew describes um, uh, his view of where we are with universities. And um, I will say that at, uh, at CSAIL, we have seen firsthand how ideas developed as part of our research can change the world. And this is very uh, energizing. Um, so I feel it is important to create 
programs for encouraging and motivating our students to be innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, but ultimately, we are a uh, uh, an educational institution. We are a research institution. Uh, our main role is to advance knowledge and um, to um, uh, to show what is possible. Uh, really, it's it's a combination of of inventing uh, the future and uh, and embracing the art of the possible uh, that uh, pushes the boundaries. Uh, now, um, let me say a few more things about this. Um, a few years ago. Most of my students wanted to go into an academic position, uh, but these days um, they see so clearly the opportunities uh, that are available and uh, and open to people interested in uh, in robotics, machine learning, AI. That many of the students really want to take the ideas they have developed as part of their thesis um, with a long time horizon and make them um, relevant today. And MIT has a lot of programs that encourage uh, this kind of uh, this kind of thinking um, for the students who want to embrace entrepreneurship. But I would say that there is still a significant gap, and the gap is between developing a research prototype, something that is good enough um, to present uh, in the scientific community that that shows the possibility for a new type of machine or a new type of capability. But taking that thing and turning it into a minimum viable product um, takes time, takes resources, takes energy. And so what I think is needed um, uh, more today um, is, is in this area of, uh, of providing bridge funding for the students who are interested in taking their thesis work and making it relevant. So that means um, that a team of students would have to be funded uh, for some period of time, maybe a year, um, to take their research prototype into something that an investor would get excited about and say, yeah, I believe this will impact the world now positively. Yeah, with a lot of this technology, as we're talking about, especially in the research phase, we're talking pretty kind of long tail for it to actually really enter the world and, and I think, you know, affect our lives in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I suspect that this question is probably kind of like, you know, picking a, a favorite child, but what what most excites the both of you in terms of kind of early stage robotics research that's happening right now? Matthew, do you want to start? Yeah, I think that there's a lot happening in, in sort of uh, industrial applications that's, uh, as Daniel was kind of highlighting earlier, that are getting really exciting. So moving away from industrial robots that have to be isolated from humans, that have to be big and heavy and dangerous. I think seeing uh, soft robots, lightweight manipulators, um, things that are compliant and that can work with humans in sort of a dynamic way. That really excites me when it comes to commercial applications, because I think that there's a variety in small and sort of medium sized manufacturing that really can be revolutionized with that kind of technology. And that really hasn't to, to date. And so I think of that, if we think about sort of where robotics can go on that axis, I think it's going to be really, really powerful. Um, from the research side, I'm particularly excited about sort of where um, applications of computer vision and, and machine learning are going with respect to robotics. So, you know, computer vision has been advanced incredibly by deep learning, obviously, and it's doing really well. And, you know, now we're sort of five years deep and people trying to apply it to various robotic applications. And I think we're still learning exactly what the right ways of doing that are. Um, but if you ask me where I think there's gonna be a lot of innovation, I do think it's gonna be in learning for robots, um, just because we've seen so much in, in other domains and there's already some good work, but it's still uh, it's still researchy enough to get me excited at a university because um, I haven't seen anybody nail it yet in a way that um, could be commercially viable. Um, so those are the two kind of big areas that I'm, I'm get me excited. Yeah, Danielle, I know you mentioned soft robotics off, off the top, uh, but what, what, what research is, is most exciting to you right now? Well, so I, uh, I still believe in, uh, in developing uh, the, the robot as, a, um, as an intelligent system uh, with a body uh, that is suitable for the capabilities you want, with a brain that is suitable for controlling the body, 
and with more intuitive um, human machine uh, interaction. So I'm interested in, uh, in these three areas. I'm interested in computational design and fabrication of, um, of uh, robot bodies um, that match the structure of the body to the task that needs to be done. I'm interested in uh, more intuitive uh, interfaces between uh, robots and people. So you don't have to be an expert in order to, um, to use a robot. And I'm also interested in the better brains um, for safety critical applications. And let me say just a few more words about this, this idea of a better brain, um, because, um, because the, the brain of the robot is, is critical. And today, most of the solutions we have for learning-based control, for using machine learning uh, to, to learn from, from data and, um, and to, um, to enhance the robot capabilities. Um, these, um, these approaches uh, result in huge models um, that are, are really difficult to understand, that are really difficult to explain, verify, and certify. But we have a safety critical field, uh, so we really need those capabilities. And so I am ex uh, excited about a new kind of uh, machine learning uh, we call liquid neural networks. Um, the, um, the approach has a, is like a continuous uh, type of neural network uh, with a very particular mathematical structure. And it results in compact uh, solutions uh, for complex applications. Uh, and these compact solutions can then be uh, verified and explained um, so that we do have the option to use learning uh, to enhance the adaptation and ge generalizability and capability of our robots. But at the same time, we can also show that our systems are verifiable and are trust, uh, trustworthy uh, within um, the set of uh, conditions that they've been built for. Great. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're all out of time right now, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Danielle and Matthew, thank you so much. Thanks for having us.